Good morning. Welcome. Um, so this morning, just hang on, I'll get there. This morning, um, I appreciated what Rachel had to say and for her, her attempt to take my theme and make it into a sort of a larger idea of, of pruning and, and as a metaphor. Um, but I'm not really gonna do that this morning um, for reasons that'll, that'll sort of, anyway, so we don't do a lot of Paul in this church. I, I realize that, um, but, but we want to, we want to try some today. We were, so we're mostly going to focus on the Ephesians passage, which the, you know, some of you will probably know isn't actually Paul anyway. Um, but, um, one of the things that I was taught to do in grad school was, was, was playing with texts. And I thought, well, you know, it's summer. Um, and, and we don't have to always have these, you know, heady theological sermons. We could actually just, just play with this text. And Ephesians is such a good text to play with. I know, I know playing with text is like this really nerdy thing to do. I, I, I get that, right? But I also recognize that I am far from the only nerd um, in this group. Um, so, so hopefully you'll just sort of go along with me, even if, even if you don't get this, right? But, so we're going we're gonna to take this Ephesians, because this Ephesians passage is just so, it's, it's this breathless thing, right? I mean, David read it nice and slowly, um, and, and that was good to try to get some of it. But what you heard there, I think in the Greek is actually only two sentences. It's all just clauses and subclauses and sub sub clauses. And it just goes on and on and on. And, and it's like, after a while, it, it's like standing in a, in a storm. And, and so I thought, well, the storm isn't probably the best metaphor. So, so I wanted to think about it more as a, as a, as, as a bouquet, right? It's all of this stuff together in a bunch. Um, but, but I realized there's a difference between a bouquet and just like throwing a bunch of flowers in a vase, right? Because I can do the throwing a bunch of flowers in a vase thing, um, and I can't do the bouquet thing um, because there's order and arrangement and thought and stuff like that. But, but sometimes, sometimes there's just too much, right? Sometimes a, uh, a bouquet is just becomes like all of the flowers you can find. And that's sort of what Ephesians is like. Ephesians is like, like all of the theological words this guy knew, he was just gonna stuff them all in there, right? Over and over and over again. And, and after a while, you just get overwhelmed by all of this verbiage. Um, and, and so you, you know, you maybe you need to chop it down a bit, right? It's this, it's this riot of religious words. So, so we're gonna, we're gonna change the metaphor here at this point and think about, about pruning because, because there's a, there's a purpose to all of this, right? And in some ways, the purpose of a bouquet is just to be a bouquet, right? It just sits there and it's pretty and, you know, you know, maybe it's supposed to provide comfort or something like that, but the purpose of a bouquet is just to, to be, um, and this writer isn't doing that. He's just not throwing a bunch of words out there so they can be pretty. He wants to do something. So we're going to prune it back a bit to see if we can, we can uh, get to the place where it should be so we can figure out, right? Because if you don't, it's like, it's like, uh, it's like an apple tree, right? If you don't prune it ever, you're really not going to get, you're just going to get a bunch of tiny little apples that don't, that don't taste good anyway. Um, so we're going to prune this back and see what we can find. Um, I, I realize, right, that, that, I am the opposite of Rachel here. I am an aggressive pruner. Um, as you probably noticed when I, when I you know, did the rhodod rhododendrons a couple summers ago. Um, and I, so I chopped things back a lot, but we'll see how it goes. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do this on the screen for you. Um, and we're gonna walk through this passage together and I'm gonna prune it. I'm gonna show you the stuff I'm gonna prune off. And then I'm gonna stop and show you what I've got left and, and give you a chance to respond because like maybe I'm taking one of your favorite verses and hacking it all apart and you don't like that. Or maybe there's stuff that I really should have taken out because you know, you're not sure what it's doing there either. Right. So, so we're going to do a little bit of a conversation um, insofar as you say anything. And if you don't obviously say anything, um, then it's going to be a very short conversation. And then we'll try to take what we've got left and, and make sense of it. Okay. So, um, let me share my screen here. Okay, how are you doing? Can you see my screen? Okay. 
So let's present this. Pruning Ephesians. Is that, is that, is that showing up? Beautiful. Okay. So, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Um, so, blessed be the God. So, this is a, a fairly typical way um, for a good Jewish writer like this person is, right, that blessings are to God, right? Even if we're blessing each other, it's always blessed be God, right? And this is a very, you know, this, is, this isn't a traditional Jewish writer. This is a Jewish Christian writer. And so, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, right? And again, we, we, could, we could unpack that even further if we wanted to, because Lord Jesus Christ, right? The Lord comes from the Greek world and the Christ comes from the Jewish world. So there's a combination of things going on here. Um, really hasn't appeared much before this part of Paul's, uh, pseudo Paul's writings. But anyway, I, I thought, so I thought, well, it's fairly standard sort of thing. I'm going to leave it in there. Who has blessed us, which is good news, in Christ. He's already said that right? With every spiritual blessing. I'm going, what's a spiritual blessing? You know, like, is that the only kind of blessing we get? I'm always, I'm always suspicious about stuff that's spiritual, which, which is sort of odd considering what I do for a living. Um, but so I, I'm going to chop it out and go in the heavenly places. And I'm going, what's it, you know, what does it mean to be blessed in the heavenly places? Right? And like, so, you know, so I, I can just going to sort of cheat and chop it out here, right? And again, if you if, if that's really important to you, we'll, we can talk about it later. But anyway, right? Just as He chose us in Christ, again, well, we we just said that twice, before the foundation of the world. And I thought again, does it matter if God called us before the foundation of the world or last Tuesday, right? The when is I think irrelevant, so I'm just going to leave it out, right? To be holy and blameless before Him, that gives us a purpose so that, i like that in love and I, again i like what's what's that doing there so I, i'm just going to chop it out right he destined us for adoption as his children through jesus christ he's already said this according to the good pleasure of his will which i understand to mean because he wanted to um and i sort of presume that to be true anyway so i'm going to chop that out okay so far so good take a deep breath away we go to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved, right? And that's again redundant. He's, a, he's just said that. Um, in him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sin. Okay, so this gives us what, what, you know, what we get out of this, according to the riches of his grace, which is again, like something he said already three times, that he lavished on us. He, here, this writer is a little different. This translation is a little different than the one Dave used. Dave had that he lavished on us with all wisdom and insight. And this writer chops a period in there, right? But anyway, with all wisdom and insight, God did something. Um, my assumption is that if God did it, God probably did it with all wisdom and insight. And if it wasn't done with all wins, wisdom and insight, then it probably wasn't God. So I'm just going to sort of take that out because it's unnecessary. God has made known to us the mystery of his will. Well, that's, that's good news, right? And, and mystery is a big theme in Ephesians, so we need, we need to leave that in there. According to the good pleasure that he set forth in Christ. Again, this is like something he said at least three times already, so we're going to just leave it out there for now, okay? As a plan for the fullness of time, right? Just to, to give us a long, this is, this is God's plan, and, and uh, again, very much part of Ephesians in the way this book is, is written to gather up, right? So this is the plan, to gather up all things in him, right? Things in heaven and on earth. I presume he already said that with all things, right? All things means things in heaven and on earth. In Christ, we have obtained an inheritance. So this is what, again, what we're getting out of this. Um, I, I, I can't read the end of that line. What does it say? He has been, no. Having, there we go, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplished all things according to his counsel and will. And again, this is possibly the fourth or fifth time he said exactly that. So that we, who were the first to set our hope um, on Christ, and obviously we aren't the first anymore, we're 2,000 years late for that. Um, so we'll just leave that out because it's not relevant to us, right? Might live for the praise of his glory. So again, this is our purpose. This isn't like what God is doing. This is what we're supposed to be doing. So I'm going to leave that in there. 
So in him, you also, when you first, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, right? And I'm just top that out because it's, it's unnecessary. It's redundant in there, right? And had believed in him, um, were marked with the seal of the promise of the Holy Spirit. So this is, this is right, again, right, the, the outcome of this. This is something that happened to you. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption of God's own people to the praise of his glory. And again, just sort of unnecessary fluff at the end. Okay, so this is what I ended up with. Um, I, only one verse got chopped completely, and that's verse eight. Um, so this is your opportunity. What, what do you think of the pruning? I, I didn't think it was overly aggressive. I think there was parts in there that I, that I could have chopped out some more. Um, did, I, did I chop out stuff you really thought you needed, or is there parts in there that you could do without, we, we, could, we could get along without them? Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Right. Yeah. Uh-huh. You're not, you're not confident in that, are you? Okay, right. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. So like verse 12, we who first set our hope on him, yeah. you, want, you want that to, to stay in there because you think that's important. Yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. 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 Oh, right. So, so Rachel, thanks. Uh, Rachel wants to keep um, the idea of... Um, we who were first in verse 12 to set our hope on him um, because she's less convinced that the rest of us are predestined and maybe just those first Christians were. Is that right, Rachel? Does that, did I understand you correctly? Okay. Yes, uh, apologize, apologies to those of you on, on Zoom. We should have been hand, handing a microphone around. Um, right. Um, that is, are there any comments from the Zoom folks about, about the, the editing? Oh, so, so Linda's wondering about we. Um, so th the assumption is that this is a writer writing to the church in Ephesus. So, so here's, here we get into a, a lot of problems because um, so the, the traditional view is that this is a, a letter that Paul, um, you see in jail at this time, I couldn't, I not, don't know this one off the top of my head, wrote to the church in Ephesus, um, a church that he knew very well because he stopped in numerous times. And so he's writing a letter to them. So that's sort of the, the basic understanding of what's going on here. And so the we is, uh, but the other side of this story is that 
the the phrase in Ephesus, that is to the church in Ephesus that it says right at the beginning, actually isn't in a number of the earlier manuscripts. And so this might just be a general letter to the church um, rather than specifically to the church in Ephesus, right? Which is why it's more broadly theological rather than regionally specific. And so the we is just all of us who are in Christ. Okay, right, well, let, 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 let's, so let's go. Um, so that's what we got left. So what's, what's he saying, right? So I think I can help you uh, make sense of this. Okay, so I, I realized I didn't sort of remove all of the flowers. There's still a lot of, a lot of um, you know, stuff in here. Um, but the flowers are part of the thing, right? It's like if you take all of the flowers out of the vase, you don't have a bouquet left at all. You just have a vase. Uh, and, and I didn't want to do that. So what is he saying? Well, first of all, he is saying that we are, are the chosen, uh, adopted children of God, right? Now he's not saying this to us, right? He is saying this, like, like Rachel pointed out, to the very earliest churches or church or churches um, in a specific part of the world. Um, and, and we can, if we want, include ourselves in this we, um, but clearly, right, Paul didn't think, wasn't thinking about Morgantown Church of the Brethren um, as he was writing this or whoever happened to be writing this. But, right, insofar as we choose to be part of the, as we choose to be in Christ, part of being in Christ, according to this writer, is being the adopted children of God. Now, it's really important to think though in that context as best we can, because thinking in our context, adopted children of God can lead us to really bad spaces, okay? This is a tiny little group of, right? If not directly persecuted, then certainly um, ignored, uh, unimportant slaves and, you know, outcasts and, you know, generally unlistened to folks who are gathering and, and have lots of reasons to believe that, you know, they may have made a serious mistake joining this whole church thing um, because they're just this tiny powerless little group and, and they're sort of just hanging in there together. And so they need something, some reason to be there. And Paul says, you're here because God chose you to be here. You need to be here because you got chosen by God. And the problem, of course, is that this gets translated into, right, Constantine takes over and suddenly, right, it becomes the, the realm of the rich and the powerful who decide that they've been chosen by God to rule over the rest of us. And then it all sort of goes to, well, you heck after that, right? And, and, and so when we take... When, you know, even we as, you know, we're hanging in there pretty well, sort of middle-class white folks take this, oh, we got chosen by God to rule over the rest of Morgantown, gets really, really dangerous, right? So, you know, we got to be really careful with this chosen language. It, it's also helpful, I think, to get a, a more Jewish sense of chosenness, right? The Jewish sense of chosenness is that the Jewish people are the chosen people of God, not because they deserve it in any way, right? Not because you're any better or smarter or faster or right, stronger than anybody else, right? God just arbitrarily chose you. And the book of Jonah comes in really handy here, right? The book of Jonah reminds us that when God chooses, chooses you, the best thing to do is run away as fast as you can. Now, the book of Jonah also reminds you that it ain't going to work, right? But still, the most logical thing to do when God chooses you, right? I mean, look in Jewish history, right? Do you really want to join a group like that, right? Right? And that's what the Jews say. They go, no, no, you don't, you, don't, you know, why would anyone, anyone want to be chosen by God, right? But, you know, like it or not, you got chosen by God, so... Here you are, right? And Paul still wants to sell this as a good thing, right? Right? 
He's, he destined us adoption as his children to the praise of his glorious day. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins. Wow. And, and right? So this, right, this connects us to God in unique sorts of way. And it connects us to God's big plan, right? Which is there, right? God's big plan, right? To gather up all things in him. That's the big plan. Right? It's not very specific, right? There's not a lot of dates and things like that in here. There's not a, you know, it'd be nice if there was a, like a four-step program or something like that. But, you know, that's the plan. Which means that ultimately what we get, everybody's going to get one of these. Right? Nothing special about us. God's plan is, right, it's like, it's like if I gave all of you today, you know, a gold star, you know, or, a, you know, a nice sticker to wear. You know, you are the chosen people of God. You get this sticker, but, you know, everybody else is going to get one too. And you go, well, that doesn't make me very special. And Paul says, yeah, exactly. It doesn't make you very special, right? But, right, for now, at least you get the sticker. Other people, they don't know yet they're getting a sticker, right? They maybe may not even want a sticker. They don't even know they want this, but, you know, they're going to get one and they're going to like it when they get one because it's a great thing, right? So that's, that's the whole point of this. And we've also got this inheritance, Right? So there's a long-term plan here. Right? It's part of this long plan that God has for the redemption of the world. And just to sort of give us a first taste, God has sent us the Holy Spirit. Right? And that's, that's the point of the Holy Spirit, is to give us this very first taste of what that redemption is going to look like, what it's going to feel like, right? how it's going to impact. Right? This is the pledge of our inheritance. So that's what happens when I try to make sense out of Ephesians is, is I chop a bunch of stuff out here um, because I just think it's way too fluffy. Um, and then, right, and, and then I think there's enough there that, that again, I can make it work. Um, Rachel already had all this stuff and Dave doesn't look convinced yet, right? And I, I can't tell from your, you know, from the people on the screen because I've got, you know, too many things going on on my screen for those of you out, out there in, in Zoom land. Um, but that was Ephesians. Thank you for being with me in this nerdy little moment um, and, and for also for being here as part of God's chosen people, um, which I suspect some of you aren't entirely convinced you're, you're feeling that, right? And so I wanna reiterate that yes, you are, you are God's chosen people, right? Whether you, whether you like it or not. Uh -huh. So our next song um, is from um, our Voices Together hymnal. I just keep seeing VT all over and think Beta's Testamentum because that's a, oh, never mind. Anyway, it's voices to, it's voices together number 720